Uh, I wanted to start off first, before I say anything about uh, the message today, I wanted a chance to be up here uh, to tell you about, about my son. Uh, for those that don't know, and, and it's hard not to because it's been prayed for up here, it's been passed around the church at large, but if uh, maybe you're newer to El Camino, this is my son Levi, and he's five years old, and he was uh, diagnosed with uh, a disease that creates non-malignant tumors in his, uh, in his organs. Uh, in November, Katie and I found out that there was uh, an exceptionally large tumor that was creating uh, big problems in his brain, uh, creating hydrocephalus water on the brain. And so he had to have what amounted to emergency surgery. So on December 5th, we were up in Phoenix, and uh, he had to go through this uh, procedure to remove the tumor, uh, do some other things to make sure the spinal fluid was not building up in his brain, was, was getting redistributed throughout his body. Um, I wanted to say thank you. Uh, and I speak for Katie. We, we have been shown an incredible amount of love and support by this church in a multitude of ways. <clears throat> and it's, we are literally overwhelmed, and it's, it's literally beyond words that we have to, to thank you for, for all that, that you have done. Um, this, this picture is taken, no joke, this picture is taken six hours after the surgery. Um, first of all, it's amazing to, to think of medicine and how far we've come a, that, a, that a doctor was in his brain monkeying around doing stuff, and, and this is him six, six hours after. Um, the, the surgery was an enormous success, and he's doing so well. Uh, if you've seen him, you've probably seen him running because that's what he, you know, he's, he's a busy bee. Uh, and, and, and flits this way and that, and so uh, we're just thankful for, for God's grace and providence that he decided uh, to, to make this thing a success, and I, I do believe that it was the power of prayer by the saints in this church and, and many others that were praying for him and for our family. So I just wanted to, to take a moment to thank you all. <clears throat> ah, all right, so moving on. <clears throat> Shame versus conviction. This is what I wanted to speak about today. This is, this is a heavy subject, too. This is not, this is not uh, light material we're going to be talking about today. But I wanted to, to speak to you about uh, these two items, shame versus conviction. Uh, these, uh, as I was doing some, some research on this topic, the, a third word kept popping up, and that was guilt. It was usually shame versus guilt, or guilt versus conviction. But I find guilt to be very different than shame or conviction. And guilt, uh, the actual, def here's the definition of guilt, right? The fact of having committed a specified or implied offense or crime. So guilt is very objective, right? You are guilty, you are not guilty. If, if I do something wrong, uh, I am guilty of that. I have guilt, I have done that offense, right? Shame and conviction are on different sides of the spectrum about how we feel about what we have done wrong, or even how we are made to feel about what we have done wrong. What we have done wrong. Uh, a perfect and unfortunate example of this is we've just gone through our presidential election cycles. Look at these happy people. Um, <laughs> I, I think regardless of where you stood on, on who these people were, I think one thing we can probably all agree on is that the best thing to come out of the election is that it's over. Uh, I, don't, I seriously don't know a single person that goes, woo, election time, yeah, so excited. Um, but we saw, this, this was the most divisive, the most uh, 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 really rendering uh, election that we've, we've ever seen. Uh, families split apart because of, of, of these candidates and because of the issues and uh, because of a whole bunch of other things. But we saw shame take a major part in this election. So if you're having a conversation with someone and, 
And they said, oh, so who did you vote for? And you said, well, I, you know, I voted for, for Trump. And they would say, well, he's a, he's a racist and he's a sexist and, and, and so are you because you voted for him. Shame! Shame. Maybe they didn't say the actual word shame, but that's what they were implying, right? Or maybe, you know, you, you, you said, well, I voted for Hillary. Well, you don't care about our, our borders. You don't care about our Second Amendment rights. You, you want socialism, not capitalism. Shame. Shame. And it was just, there, there was no way to win. You were going to have shame about whoever you voted for. And even, even if you didn't vote for either of these people, you still received shame. If you said, well, I, I, you know, I, I don't really care for, for either one of them, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to vote for a third-party candidate. Well, you're wasting your vote. That's horrible. What are you doing? Do you, shame. Or you said, well, I, I'm, I'm just done, kind of done with the political process. I don't even want to participate. I'm not going to vote. Well, that's your patriotic duty. I, you know, you have to vote. That, it's shame. And so it was, it was so rampant. And if you're on Facebook, it's, it's like 10 thousand times worse. It just every other post you would see would be a political post, and it's not a, a th well, this is what I think about the issues or the policies that are being discussed. It's, it's talking about the people involved in the election and talking about how bad everyone was that, 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 that wasn't voting for the same person as you. So it was just a horrible, horrible time. So I wanted to, to bring up my first point even before we got into Scripture this morning which is shame comes from man and conviction comes from God. Shame comes from man and conviction comes from God. Now, as I was uh, rereading this uh, yesterday, uh, it says shame comes from man. Ladies, you're not out of the discussion. I, I meant mankind. Mankind, you know, big. But shame comes from man, conviction comes from God. Think about the times where you have felt shamed it's because of other people, maybe even because of yourself. But if you have felt convicted, that is directly from God. It might even be through someone else. You know, if, if you've done something wrong and someone approaches you in a, in a loving way that we're supposed to as Christians and said, hey, I, you know, I don't think what you're doing is right. Maybe you need to look in God's word about that. that that's conviction, but that's coming from God through someone else, right? So shame comes from man Conviction comes from God. That's the first point. The text that we're going to be looking at today is from John chapter 8. So if you want to turn there now. Now, I, I went through my whole message and, and got it all organized and, and laid out and, and uh, felt that it was, everything was, was pretty much in place. And then I realized that my text this morning is from the book of John, which happens to be the book that Pastor Ron's going through. And he's just at the beginning, so uh, if Pastor Ron is watching now or later, I didn't mean to step on your toes, I, I wasn't even thinking. And for all of you, once he gets up to chapter 8, just kind of pretend like you haven't heard this before. <laughs> just kind of like, oh, that's a great story, I, I wasn't aware. So, um, so John, John chapter 8, uh, verse 2 is where we're going to begin this morning. Early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people were coming to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, and having set her in the center of the court, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. So, as we look at this story, what I want you to do is kind of place yourself within the story. Uh, this is a narrative. These are real people. These are real events that actually happened. So try and gain a, a different perspective where you're not just someone reading this from the Bible. Try and get yourself into the events that are happening. Maybe you'll gain a, a, a different perspective. So Jesus, as he was doing so often, is in the, is in the temple, and he's, he's teaching. He's, he's got a big group of people around him. He's, he's talking about uh, the law, he's talking about his, his grace, he's, he's doing all of, all of uh, the stuff that he, he did uh, every day of his life, uh, every day of his ministry life. And right in the middle of it, right in the middle of his teaching time, here come the Pharisees with this woman who has been caught in adultery. And they don't just hang out 
on, uh, at the side of the temple and, and kind of wait their turn to, to humbly go ask Jesus his opinion about something. They make sure that all eyes are on them. They, they, they haul out this woman in the center of, of the temple and just kind of throw her on the ground and say, this woman got caught doing something bad. Uh, I think we should punish her. What do you think? So, next point is shame shifts blame, but conviction is accountable. See, I, I'm going give, I'm to give you a hint. When, when the Gospels talk about the Pharisees, it's not really positive. The Bible doesn't paint them in a great light, right? Yes, they were religious leaders, but they didn't really practice what they preached. Uh, they were guilty of a lot. And yet, they don't, we don't see them come into the center of the court and throw themselves down in front of Jesus and say, I, I'm, I'm not a good, good guy. I, I'm, I'm a sinner. I need you to tell me how to live better. That's not what they do. They, they haul someone else in and make sure that they're pointing the finger at that person. So shame makes sure that the blame isn't on me. It's on that person over there. Conviction, though, when we are convicted we hold ourselves accountable. We take the, point, the pointed finger and make sure it's pointing at ourselves. No one else is responsible. I'm responsible. The story continues. Verse 5. And, the, and this is uh, the Pharisees talking to Jesus. Now in the law of Moses, uh, now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say? They were saying this, testing him so that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. And when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. So, <clears throat> again, place yourself in this, in this situation. Maybe you're a, a bystander. Uh, and, and seeing what's going on. The, the Pharisees have brought this woman, thrown her down in the center of the court, uh, and said, well, she's done something wrong. The law says that we should stone her. What do you think? It kind of sounds innocent enough. It kind of sounds innocuous, right? They want, to, uh, they want to make sure the law is, is, uh, is, is carried out, Right? Well, we're told that they did this to test him. So how, do, how were they testing him? Well, in, in this time, the Romans were occupying the Jewish people, right? So it was the Romans' duty to have a trial to carry out the sentence. That was the Romans' duty. And if Jesus said, well, yeah, uh, the, the law says go ahead and stone her because of her offense, well, he is, it, 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 this is in, remember, this is in a public place. Jesus is making a verdict, and he's agreeing to carrying out a sentence. So he's doing something that was fit only for the Romans of the time. So if he says yes, then he gets the Romans upset at him for doing something that, that they should be doing. Now, if he says no, well, then the Jews are going to be upset at him, right? Because he's saying that, well, the, the, you know, maybe she just, like, made a mistake. Let's, let's give her a break. Uh, don't bother carrying out the law. Well, now the Jews are going to be upset because he's saying the law isn't what we, what we go by, right? So, that's a pretty, pretty good predicament that the Pharisees have gotten Jesus into, right? This is kind of foolproof. They've backed him right into a corner. If he says yes, Romans are going to be mad at him. If he says no, Jews are going to be mad at him. Some group, whatever he says, is going to be mad at them, just like the Pharisees are mad at him. And now they have someone on their side and can kind of continue their onslaught uh, of, of getting rid of him. Because Jesus is this guy that's taken the crowds uh, from them. The spotlight's no longer on, 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 on the Pharisees. They're no longer the, the real, true religious authority because people are seeing who Jesus is. So... Imagine you're a Pharisee. Picture yourself in a Pharisee. I know that might not feel too good to do that, but picture yourself as a Pharisee, 
you've got Jesus cornered, he's got no escape, so you, you give him this yes or no question, and no matter what he says, you've got him. So you ask him, and he just kind of does this number. Well, that's unexpected. Uh, it's, why, is it, why is he just writing on the ground? I don't know. Uh, Jesus, we ask you a question. They persist. When he doesn't answer them, they persist and ask him again. And so then he stands up and he says, uh, he who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Probably something uh, that you, if you've been in church a while, you've probably heard. And then he goes back and starts writing on the ground again. Now, we're unsure of what he wrote. Uh, you know, the Bible doesn't actually specify what he wrote. I, I'm going to throw out that he probably wasn't drawing smiley faces or things like that. Uh, one of the kind of purveying thoughts on it, and, and, and uh, it, again, this is just conjecture because we're not told in Scripture, but one of the purveying thoughts is that he was writing some of the law on the ground and then maybe naming some of the Pharisees among them because we see their reaction to whatever he was writing is this. This is verse 9. When they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones. And he was left alone in the woman where she was in the center court. Now, <clears throat> as he's writing, whatever he is writing is enough for them to go, I don't want to stick around here. I'm gone. Uh, I do think it's kind of amusing that it, it says the older ones, perhaps the, one with, the ones with a little more wisdom, a little more maturity, kind of see what's going on maybe ahead of time and go, nope, I'm, I'm out of here. Uh, I don't want to stick around. The younger ones are maybe a little more brash and, and not seeing this, this train of, of conviction coming at them. Um, but they leave. One by one, they just go out till all that is left is Jesus and the woman in the center of the court. So, next point. Shame runs from responsibility. Conviction accepts the consequences. Shame runs from responsibility. Conviction accepts the consequences. These Pharisees had shame. They wanted to shame this woman who, who they brought to Jesus, but they were the ones that ended up being shamed, and they didn't want any part of it. They weren't going to sit around and say, and, and, and again, we're, we're, we're conjecturing that he wrote out law, something of a convicting fashion. And they didn't want any part of that. They didn't want to be convicted. They didn't want to own up to the things that they had done wrong. So they skedaddled. They fled. They wanted to run from responsibility. Who is the one left with Jesus? It's the woman. It's the woman who was brought in and made to feel shame, but she has stayed accepting her consequences. Story continues. This is verse 10. Straightening up, Jesus said to her, and, and might I say on that point, <clears throat> as he stoops to write on the ground, Whose level is, is, is Jesus on? He has loader, lowered himself to be with the woman. He's not standing over her in judgment. He's lowered, herself, uh, he's lowered himself. So straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go. From now on, sin no more. So something that we haven't talked about that I, I wanted to make sure we mention. At no point did Jesus ever say, well, what you did, uh, it was a little bit wrong, but let's not worry about that. He didn't say, well, let's just kind of sweep it under the rug for now and, and, you know, it's not that bad. He recognized sin for what it was. Sin, right? He didn't say that it wasn't. In fact, when he says, 
from now on sin no more. He's acknowledging the fact that what she did, what she was caught in, the act that she was caught in, was sin. But what he says is, I don't condemn you. Now remember what he had said to the Pharisees. Is that he who is without sin, let him be the one to cast the first stone. Who was the one without sin? Jesus was the one without sin. He had every right to cast the first stone. He was blameless. He was pure. He was holy. He was without sin. He had every right to cast a stone at her under the law. But he says, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. So my last point. Shame attempts to hide sin. Conviction promotes change. Shame attempts to hide sin. Conviction promotes change. When he said, go and sin no more, he wasn't saying, go and try and be better. He didn't say, go and, you know, sometimes life is hard and you fall into things. Uh, try to avoid that, and, uh, but, you know, if you do... Eh, if, he was very clear. Go and sin no more. Don't just do what you've always done. Do something different. Conviction has to have change on the other side of it. Shame tries to hide sin, right? We, we, uh, we make sure that, that people aren't aware of our sin uh, because we don't want them telling us that we should do something different. That's, that's convicting. We, we want to kind of have, and, and I think we, if we're all truthful, we might even have a, a little pet sin here or there where we kind of ha- make sure that's hidden and uh, we don't want people knowing about it because then people might tell us to stop. But conviction stays in the light. The, the sin stays in the light with conviction because we want to see change. So, If I'm going to stand up here and talk to you about shame versus conviction, I need to be willing to tell you what I have shame about. I have shame that I have not been nearly intentional enough in creating relationship with people who don't know Jesus for the express purpose of telling them his plan of salvation. I have shame about that. I've, I've told a few people this, and uh, a response that I've gotten is, well, you're, you're a pastor, and so, uh, you know, discipleship is your thing. You, you mentor people, and you disciple them, and you, you help them uh, in their own Christian walk so that they can be better and go out and tell people. That's great. But I have a responsibility that supersedes my responsibilities as a pastor, that supersedes my responsibilities as a husband and a father, because I first have a responsibility as a Christ follower. And God has told every single person who calls themselves a Christian to go and tell others about who he is. And I could say, well, you know, I, I, I spend like 50 plus hours at church every week and, and doing seminary and, and I have a wife and kids and, and time just is a factor. Well, I'm shifting blame. I'm running from responsibility. I'm hiding the thing that I have shame about. My shame is that I haven't been intentional enough in creating, resp- in creating relationships with those that don't know Christ. I do stand before you, though, not ashamed, but convicted. I want you all to know of the things that I struggle with. I want you to know that I want to change. I want to be different. I want to be held accountable. I don't want to live in shame. I want to live in conviction. I wanted to, uh, to illustrate this point because shame very much is a, a burden and it weighs on us. So I have this book here. This, uh, this is a book that was given to me, I think, when I was six years old. And this book is, I'll hold it up. It's called Dangerous Journey, and it's a pictorial version of 
Pilgrim's Progress. Pilgrim's Progress is, is one of the most popular books of all time. It's more than 400 years old. Uh, this book is not 400 years old. This is probably like 30 years old. Um, but it's the story, if you don't know uh, Pilgrim's Progress, Pilgrim, uh, there's too many Ps. Pilgrim's Progress is about a man named Christian, and he has this huge burden on his back. You can see it here. It's, it's a literal burden on his back. It's huge. It weighs down on him. It tires him out. He lives in the city of destruction. Now, uh, if you lived in a city called the city of destruction, you might want to think about moving. Um, but Christian has a book, and the book tells him, yeah, you need to move out of the city of destruction. You need to go to the celestial city. And so Christian takes this journey. And along the journey, there's people uh, that, that help him and that kind of direct him in the right way, get him back on track. Uh, people with names like Mercy and Faith and Evangelist. And there's also people that try and trip him up. Um, people like Mr. Worldly Wiseman and Obstinate and Pliable. Uh, he goes through and, and, and encounters demons and, and, uh, and fights with them and, and, and all of this really amazing stuff. It's, it's a very uh, intense book to read. But I wanted to share with you this passage. This is my very favorite passage from this book. Um, he's, uh, he's gone along his journey and he's, he's going towards the celestial city, but he still has this burden on his back. How his burden had got on his back in the first place and why nobody else had burdens, as happens in dreams, we are not told. But never had he been so eager as he was now to be rid of it. And that, did he but know it, was half the battle. Now I saw in my dream that the road from then on was fenced on either side with a wall. The wall was named Salvation. Along this road did burdened Christian run, or should we say he did his best to run so far as he could, with that load upon his back. At the foot of a hill, he passed an open tomb. Then up again upon a little knoll, he found himself beneath a wayside cross. And as its shadow fell across him, so suddenly the burden, slipping from his shoulders, fell from off his back. It tumbled down the hill. It tumbled into the mouth of the tomb. It was never seen again. Christian kept feeling behind his back. He couldn't believe it, for it was very surprising to him that the simple act of gazing at the cross had set him free, and his burden was gone. As a child reading this, that just gave me joy. I, I, had, I had placed myself, you know, when you're a kid and you're reading books, you place yourself in the hero's perspective, right? And to be weighed down by this burden constantly and that the simple act of gazing at the cross is what released him from his burden. Maybe there's something in your life that you're burdened by. Maybe that's, it's such a huge thing that it's weighing you down. You feel it constantly. That there's, there's this experience that you've had or maybe you've, you've mistreated someone. It, it could be a million different things, but it's a burden of shame. I want to tell you that, that this isn't right. This is not what God wants for you. He doesn't want you to feel shame. He wants you to feel convicted. 